Luke chapter 18, and let us start in verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes to all of all of that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Father God, we thank you for tonight, Lord God. I thank you for another opportunity and privilege it is, Lord God, to come together with your people to worship you, Lord God, to give you thanks and to give you praise, Father God. Lord, I thank you for every person in this place. I thank you for every member of your body, Lord God. Father, if we know that we are one body with many members, Father, and each member has a purpose, Lord God, each member has a plan that you have given them, Father God. And Lord, our prayer, God, for this month, Lord God, and for always, Lord, is that we come against the spirit of strife that is in the body of Christ. Father, our heart, Lord God, is to bring unity because we know, Lord, when unity flows, Father God, the anointing flows. And when the anointing flows, Lord God, that breaks the bondages, Lord God. It destroys the yokes, Father. So, Lord, I ask you tonight to give us ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying, Lord. Let your word go forth like seed and let it not return unto you void, God, but let it accomplish that for which you have sent it. Let it save, let it deliver, let it heal, Father, but let it convict, Lord God. Help us to grow, Lord God. Help us to walk in love, Lord God. Father, and help us, Lord God, to do what it is that you've called us to do, and that is to love others, Lord God. And, Father, just preach your God. Gospel, Father, we thank you and we praise you. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I'm doing my Godfather impression tonight or my Joe Cocker uh, impression. Um, I thank God for my team. Didn't they do an awesome job tonight? Amen. You know, it, it, it just goes to show you that nobody in the kingdom is indispensable especially when it comes to worship. God says, with two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And I just thank God uh, for my team, my husband being faithful um, and just standing in the gap for me. Um, I am not sick, thank the Lord. Uh, just been preaching a lot. I had a service on Sunday morning. Then I was here Sunday night. And then yesterday morning, uh, we went back to um, Bayside Community Church and uh, I was ministering for, not kidding you, four hours. So uh, if you got to lose your voice, praise God. What a, what a great way to lose it. Um, God was uh, certainly in the house yesterday. A uh, few people from here came, so I thank you for coming. Um, I love this series that we're in, Who's in Your Boat? Um, God is definitely doing something in the body of Christ. I believe he is calling all of us to come up higher. Amen to not major in minors, but to truly walk in love. Um, on March 13th, there's an event happening at Deer Park High School. It's called Long Island Awakening. It is not about lifting up one church or one man or one woman, one pastor. You know, it, it's about exalting and, and praying for unity within the body of Christ. Um, and, you know, I thank God for this thing that's happening because it really is amazing to me why we can't get along. Why people just can't get along. I mean, why can't we all just play in the sandbox nice together? Amen? Um, it, it, it amazes me that in the Bible that we never ever see demons fighting with one another. But throughout the word of God, we see Christians fighting and not getting along 
And Jesus said, a house divided against itself will not stand. Amen? But he also, you know, God also said, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, you know, I, I see so often um, that people just have this need to be right. And right at any cost. And, and as I titled this message, I titled it, The Need to Be Right Can Make You Oh So Wrong. So be humble before you stumble. Let me write it down so you guys can write it down. The need to be right can make you oh so wrong, so be humble so you don't stumble. If, if we would just take a moment and really take the words of Jesus to heart and truly learn how to love each other, we would see unity. And when there is a spirit of unity, the Bible says it when, when, how lovely it is when brethren come together and dwell in unity. It, it's, it's like the oil that is poured out um, it, that flowed from Aaron's beard from the top of his head to, to his beard that it, that it flows out. And when unity is, is, is happening, that's where the anointing can flow. That's why the enemy tries so hard to divide the saints of God. Because as long as we are fighting with one another, there is no unity. If there is no unity, there is no anointing. And so when we, when we learn how to love, learning how to love involves learning how to speak to one another, when to speak, and when not to speak. Learning how to love means everything is done in decency and order. It means following the rules. You know, sometimes Christians have a really hard time with um, following the rules. And, and that's all part of love, that everything in, in the body of Christ, when it is of God, it is done in decency and order. And we need to be careful that we walk in the righteousness of Christ and not in our own self-righteousness. Amen? Um, we're really good at pointing out all the big sins in people, adultery, murder, stealing. But let's talk about the stuff that we don't want to talk about and the stuff that most people or a lot of people in the body of Christ are guilty of, and that is gossiping. It's tail-bearing, envy. We never really think about those as sin, and I think we don't really talk about those things so much because there's a lot of people doing it. And a lot of times, people are justifying it because they're using that, that verse that says, well, ye who are spiritual can judge all things. Listen, God hates sin. He hates it. And he really hates the gossiping and the tail-bearing and the backbiting and, and the tearing apart the kingdom because it's causing a spirit of, of strife. And I'll tell you, there is nothing more precious than life. We get, we get report prayer requests all the time that, you know, somebody's on life support and we're praying for somebody to live. And when you think about it, if our life here is so precious, how much more is our eternal life? How precious is that? In fact, it is, um, you know, it is so important to understand that Christ loved his church so much that he gave his life for our church. Do we understand that when God's people fuss and fight and try to debate and to prove their point, and now we have this wonderful thing called the pre preacher police that's out there, um, that we are actually tearing down the very thing that Christ gave his life for? Think about it. For God so loved the world the world, all of us, because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Sinning means that we've missed the mark. And God has loved us so much that God sent his son, not just his best offering, it was his only son. 
And he loved us so much that Christ gave his life for his church. So when we take part in gossiping, when we take part in tailbearing, when we take part tearing down somebody's reputation, tearing down somebody's ministry because we don't agree with something, we are actually tearing down the very thing that Jesus gave his life to build. And we don't think like that because we think that we are doing things and we're saying things and we're, and we're proving our rightness, so to say, you know, for the glory of God. And yet, when you're assassinating someone's character, when you're, when, you're, when you're talking about another ministry, when you're talking about something that's going on, you don't understand how in that moment or that ministry, God is using that person to bless someone else. And you're robbing somebody of a blessing. You know, I know that this is like Christianity 101, but until we get to understand the basic things, we cannot move. And we can't move in the bigger things. And, you know, the island has been so dry. Did anybody, did we ever ask ourselves, why? Why is it dry? And we can't blame it all on the devil. Because you know what? We're grown-ups. And we're Christians. And we have the word of God that is a blueprint for our life. And if we followed the blueprint... If we learned how to work the word, we would see the word work. Amen? And, and, and this, is, this is not beating up on anybody or picking on anybody, but it, it's, it's just something that I think that we really, really need to start to look at. Because if we want to break bondages, if we really are the family of God, there's that old song, I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God. And yet... When I go on Facebook or sometimes you turn the television on, it's one thing that when the world mocks us and it's one thing when the world betrays us as crazy people, but it's another thing when God's people are mocking God's people and tearing people down because we are arguing about things that really do not matter. And the Bible says in Timothy that we are not to debate and to, and to come against each other with idle babblings just because we have this need to be right. Sunday I preached a message um, about the Beatitudes. Don't mistake my meekness for weakness. And, and the, 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 the scripture goes, you know, blessed are, are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. I encourage you to either watch it on YouTube or, or get, the, get the CD of it. Um, but tonight I want to touch on two more Beatitudes. And that is, first one I want to touch on is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And you know, I love God because he has some, sometimes he's got a real strange way of saying things. Um, What does it mean to be poor and to be poor in spirit? Because right away when I hear the word poor, my mind goes right to having nothing, being poor. And I know that poverty, and this is, I just don't believe that poverty is of God. I don't believe it. Why? Because, you know, the Bible says that the Lord will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Now listen, not everybody is going to be a millionaire or a billionaire, but God says, I shall supply all your needs according to to my riches and glory. He says that my people will be blessed to be a blessing. It means that you're going to have so much that you can share some stuff. Um, We serve Jehovah Jireh our provider. We serve a God who is a father. And if you understand the nature of a father, he provides and he protects and he teaches and he loves. He takes care of that which belongs to him. So um, when he calls himself El Shaddai, that means the all-sufficient one. He is the many-breasted one. He is the God of of more than enough. So when it says poor in spirit, we're not talking about poverty. Amen? Um, And he doesn't say 
he doesn't say blessed be the poor, but he says blessed be the poor in spirit. So what is exactly poor in spirit? Poor in spirit, it doesn't refer to shyness or false humility or it's people who have um, are insecure and have inferiority complex um, or a suppression of your natural personality. Um, there's such a thing as false humility, okay? Um, which is really just a form of, of self-pity that uses um, humility as a way to draw attention to themselves. Um, most of us, you know, will instinctively kind of stay away from people like that because we know that something's not right there, so we, we tend to back off. Um, so then when we think about what it's not, what exactly is it? And it may help you to know that there are two Greek words for it, uh, for the word poor. One means that you have just enough to get by, um, and the other one means that you have nothing at all. It's the difference between being down to your last dollar or um, it means to be flat broke. And there's a difference between that. In the verb form, the word means to crouch or to beg. It describes a person who is utterly helpless and completely dependent on others. That's how God uses the word here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who are helpless, they are aware of who they are within themselves if it had not been God who touched their life. Poor in spirit are people who realize I have a need for God. Amen? The other beatitude I want to talk about tonight is blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And mind you that the beatitudes is marked as the greatest sermon that Jesus ever preached. And what he's doing in this sermon is he is discipling people. He is telling them that if you're going to follow me, this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. This is what it means to be a true Christian. So Matthew 5.10, Jesus said, blessed are those, uh, the, the word righteousness is like, it's used four times by Matthew. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. That's the eighth and the final beatitude. When you take the fourth and the eighth beatitudes together, you get something like this. We are to hunger and thirst after a kind of life that will cause some people to per persecute us for our faith. So righteousness is a lifestyle that distinguishes us as a true Christian and invites opposition from the world. I'm going somewhere tonight, so just be patient. The second use comes from Matthew 520. It says, for I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Pharisees had concocted this system of beliefs that basically, you know, you can do it on your own. They didn't, they had rules and they had regulation. Um, they, they were all about what it looks like on the outside. They were performance people, okay? It's, it's very, it's, it's, it's like, how do you say it with when, when your child doesn't uh, take a shower and tries to douse themselves with perfume or cologne to hide what they really smell like. That's what it is. That's what being a Pharisee is. So that's why he's saying that your righteousness needs to surpass that. Well, what does that mean? It means that they're walking in self-righteousness. True righteousness. I can't, be, I can't be righteous. I can't be righteous on my own. Christ had to die. It's in his righteousness that now I become righteous. Amen? Matthew 6, 1 gives us the third use of this word. He, he says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
The Pharisees loved to pray publicly. They love to show up and show off. Look at me. Look at what I can do. I can do this and I can do that. They care more about their title. They care more about their, 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 their status rather than their substance. That's what a Pharisee does. Um, and most of us already know the last verse, Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. So the question here is what exactly as the body of Christ, together corporately and individually, what is it that we are seeking? Are we seeking status or are we seeking substance? Now don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because when God blesses something, success will come to it. It will grow. So there's no sin in success. Because a lot of times people want to couple all the mega churches that are out there and say that they're not of God. That's not true. That is not true at all. When God is in something, he's a God of multiplication. He multiplies things. But on the other hand, just because something is big and something glitters and something might look like that's success doesn't necessarily mean that it really has substance. So, so basically, if you put all of this together, these four passages together, what do you have? And it, it shows you what we are to hunger and what we are to thirst after. Number one, a true Christian lifestyle. One that has changed us from the inside out. So that we no longer seek the praise of men, but causes us to seek God's approval above everything else. And this kind of life is possible for all of us. In fact, Jesus plainly says that anyone who lives like this is blessed of God. It doesn't say anything about being perfect. It just, it's talking about having that desire that, Lord, I truly want to live what it is that you want me to live. I want to be who you want me to be. I want to love. I want, I want to forgive. I, wa I want to be a giving person. I want to do the things that you told me to do. God, I want you to touch my heart. Somebody, somebody came to me on a prayer line and I said, I, I have a big problem. I'm, I'm in an inappropriate relationship. And I said, okay. And she goes, you know, I know I need to get out of it. And I said, are you sorry for being in it? And they said, no. I said, well, the only way out of this thing is for you to repent. Because here's the thing. Are you sorry that you did it? And you're sorry for the sin because you've got a relationship with Jesus or you're just sorry you got caught. It's the difference between religion and relationship. Religion doesn't have a heart for God. It doesn't say, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that because, you know what, I, I just love you, God. And I know that when I'm in sin, it separates me from you. And listen, God understands that we've got things in our life that we can't deliver ourselves from. But the Lord puts the whole Jesus, but the Holy Spirit inside of us. It's how we met Jesus. He puts the Holy Spirit inside of us, and it's the Holy Spirit that, that is the agent in salvation that draws us to Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, the Holy Spirit is in you so that when you've got something troubling your life and there is something that you cannot do by yourself, that you can call upon God and he can deliver you from whatever it is. You know, some people, we always think about that, you know, when it comes to drug addiction or, or alcoholism or something like that. But some people just can't help themselves from gossiping. Some people just have a lousy, you know, angry attitude. Some people have, have deep-rooted resentment about stuff that happened 20 years ago. Listen, you can't get delivered of that in yourself. But through Christ, when you call upon his name, he can deliver you from anything. But here's the thing. You've got to be sincere in what you're asking God to do. 
Otherwise, it's just religion. And religion will lead to death, but the relationship will lead to life. Is this okay this morning, tonight? I don't even know what day it is. What are you hungry for? You know, I mean, I believe that we're just at a point in time where God is, God is about to do something. I mean, I saw something in this prayer meeting that I was at yesterday, this meeting. I mean, it, it was awesome. And I'll tell you, the hunger that I'm seeing here, I'm seeing it there. Because God has really got his remnant and he's got his people that the Holy Spirit is speaking to people. There's something coming. And we have got to prepare ourselves. We've got to prepare ourselves for it to get our hearts right, to get our walk right, to get our mouths right. Because there is a harvest of souls that is coming in. And you don't have to listen to the news more than five minutes to understand we are in the last days, honey. We are in the last days. And if we're so busy fighting with one another, how are we going to help that harvest? How are we going to work that harvest if we're at odds with each other fighting over stupid things that really don't matter? Because the truth be told, I think we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven about how much of it we all got wrong. What we spent so much time trying to be right and proving this point and proving that point and who speaks in tongues and who doesn't speak in tongues and who thinks, you know, uh, having mu musicians in the church is wrong and, you know, you need three slow songs and that, you know, people fight over craziest things. What's the difference between praise and worship? Well, praise is fast and worship is, is slow. And people, I mean, you laugh, but people have debates about it. The people end up never speaking to one another again over silly things like this, things that don't matter. You want to know the difference between praise and worship? Listen, whatever you want to do, if you can enter into the holy holies doing a fast song, then you sing that fast song. If you need a slow song, because worship is about the heart. It is about the heart. You know, tonight was a, good, was, a, was a good example of that. I didn't lead worship. It was the most frustrating thing I ever did to sit there and not be a part of my team up here. But you know what? They didn't need me to get the Spirit of God to flow in this room. Why? Because it was the heart of worship. It's not about talent. It's not about a male or a female. It's not about a great voice. Because listen, there are great voices that can bring you to your feet, but it is an anointing that will bring you to your knees. And what are you seeking? Are you seeking substance or are you seeking status? And we get caught up and we make minor things major. And major things like loving one another, like keeping the peace, like building the kingdom and not tearing it down as a minor thing. You see, Pharisees have the letter of the law, and to have the letter of the law with no heart is lethal. It will kill. It will absolutely kill. In, in, you know, and, and it, it, it's an amazing thing because the very first beatitude, the first one that Jesus says, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is there. And the text that we read tonight in Luke, we see these two men. And here's this Pharisee. And he's all, he's all dressed up. And he's so holy and humble that he's proud of it. Read the text. I mean, I read it in the Message Bible, and I read it. It's, it's, it's really, it, it, it is amazing. So filled with pride. God, I come to you, and look at what I've done for you. I pray, and I do this, and I do that, and I give you all the tithes of everything that I possess. He wasn't praying to God. He was giving God his resume. And you see, that's what happens in our prayer closets. We go to God and, and we begin to tell him everything that we've done right. All that we do for God. And sometimes we forget who we are. Because it's not because of who I am or what I am or where I am or what I've done or what I can do. It's all because of whose I am. And here you have the other man. He's the Bible calls him a publican. He's a, he's a tax collector. 
In the Bible, those were the worst kind of people. And the Bible says that this man is justified because he, he realizes he's poor in spirit. He says, I, 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 can't even, I can't even look at heaven. Now, thank God, because of Jesus, we don't have to be ashamed. But that was his attitude. He was aware of who he was without God. I'm not worthy. I can't even, I, I really even shouldn't be talking to you. He was poor in spirit. And, and, and Jesus says, well, who's better? And Jesus says, it's the publican. It's the one without the fancy clothes. It's the one who doesn't pray fluently. You know, so many people ask me all the time, how do you pray? I don't know how to pray. I don't know how. You want to pray? Talk to God. Talk to him like you would talk to your best friend. That's how you pray. That's how God wants to hear you. God does not want you to come into your prayer closet and pretend to be something that you're not because you think that thing pleases him. You see, the Pharisees, they knew about God, but they didn't know God. They had religion, but they had no relationship whatsoever. You know, there's a reason when I, when I look at the teachings of Jesus and, and, and I'll tell you, as I've been on Facebook, it has really broken my heart to see the body of Christ literally tearing one another apart. And I've become very upset about it. And not just, listen, this is not about, I, I love the way um, somebody said it on, on their Facebook message yesterday. Listen, if I post something, I'm just posting something that I like. It do okay, everybody knows it's Jackie. She's looking at him. <laughs> but I said, Jackie, you preach it. Just because I post something that I heard that I liked that it touched my heart. Don't go reading into it. And thinking that I'm having a mental breakdown or that I'm starting to fight or that my marriage is, is in trouble, that, that I'm sick in my body. Like, don't, don't put that kind of cloud on Facebook. I mean, sometimes I put stuff on there. I'm just, I'm just in my daily day and God speaks something to my heart and I put it on there. And no, I mean, and I've had, listen, I've had it too. Are you fighting with somebody? Somebody coming after you? Are you all right? Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen, I'm, you know, when, when I get done tonight, I will go home. Well, tonight I'm going to go home and sleep, and tomorrow I'll sleep. But probably by tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to start working on next week's word. I, I, don't, I don't just come up with this stuff. i got to get before God, and I've got to pray. And so my sermons, they take me weeks, a week to do. And really, when I'm doing a series, I, I've got four or six weeks that are already going. So God is speaking stuff to me, and sometimes I just want to encourage people. Or God will lay a nugget of wisdom on me, and I'll just put it on my Facebook. Stop reading into it. Um, and the reason that, you know, when, when I look at the Word of God and, and, I, and I see what's going on Facebook, I never see Jesus angry except when he gets around the Pharisees. When he gets around legalistic people, it's like Jesus kind of like loses it. I mean, he, he, he overturned the temple. And the only people, you never hear Jesus talking negatively about a sinner. You never hear Jesus screaming and yelling at sinners that they're going to hell. I mean, Jesus... Believe it or not, he had manners. I mean, do we even know what manners are today in the body of Christ? Because I don't think we do. Because some of the most horrible and meanest people and rudest people that I've ever met in my life are Christians. And I'm so, I feel so bad about saying that. But my life... I have never been hurt by the world than I have been by Christians. Christians who, you know, 
God didn't say you could do that. You can't be that. You can't do this. You can't do Everything is about what you can't be and what you can't do. I mean, somebody starts out in ministry. Listen, it's a difficult thing being in ministry, especially when you just start growing in it and you don't know what you're doing yet. You're not comfortable behind a pulpit. You're not comfortable. Listen, I'm doing this 10 years here. I mean, and I'm 33 years in ministry, but 10 years just in this one place. And I got to tell you, there was a lot of growth from February 10 years ago to the February that we're in right now. And thank God for patient people. I mean, there were things and note things when I go back into my books and I look at my notes and I'd say, well, I don't see it like that anymore because I was in a different place 10 years ago. Look what the Lord has done. What was important for me to understand and do, I had all I could do because I was just starting out preaching. I didn't know. I was so insecure. And it's funny, when people see the anointing on you, and there's a certain confidence, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's just an anointing. And people start saying, you know, she's so, she's so full of herself. And I said, my God, if you only knew the truth. I think it was I, I probably up until... I don't even think I still, I always kind of look at Janine like, well, was it good? And she'll go, it was good. And if I've said something wrong, she'll say, you know, you might not want to say that like that. Because I know that I don't do this in my own strength. I'm not all that and a bag of chips. But God exposes the Pharisees. He does not hide their stuff. Because he's telling us, this is what I don't want you to be. Think about how true that is. Because Pharisees have this need to be right. Whatever comes out of anybody's mouth. And listen, I am not condoning. We've got to learn. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. Okay? I can't tell you how many ordinations I went through because I studied. I wanted to get approved and approved and approved. But there comes a point in time where you've already been approved because you've already been called by God. Man doesn't call you. An ordination, all it is is a public recognition of what you've already been doing. Can you say amen? Um. And the reason that God has got a problem with this pharisaical spirit is one, is because their righteousness is of their own doing. It has nothing to do with God. They thought that they were better than everybody. They thought they knew more than everybody. And it was like they just kind of bypassed God and said, I am God. Because blessed are the poor in spirit. They will inherit the kingdom of God. There again, there is that principle and there's that promise. That when we are poor in spirit, when we understand the need for God in our life, we will inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is ours. When we understand who we are. And that doesn't mean that we walk around, poor me, I'm no good. Listen, I am the king's daughter. You are the king's daughter. You are the king's son. You are not ordinary. You are extraordinary. And I can boast, and I can boast in Christ. Not in myself. Because in myself, I can't do anything. In my own righteousness, I'm like filthy rags, but because of Christ, I can say that I am somebody. And here's the thing. Um, the Pharisees, they're more concerned about being right than they are about people. They're more concerned about being right, about what they believe and what they want. And they made up all kinds of stuff to make themselves look bigger, to make themselves look better. Um, 
And it's, it's a scary thing because in Revelations, I believe it's chapter 2, when, when he speaks to the church of Ephesus, he says, listen, I've seen your works and you've, you've, you've done great, guys. You, you, have kept, you have kept the commandments. You, 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 you've hated what I've hated. You've loved what I've loved. You've done so many great and awesome things. And I've seen every great thing that you've ever done. But, but this one thing I have against you, and that is with all of these great things that you're doing, you left your first love. In other words, you forgot the whole deep meaning of what drew you into this whole thing, what drew you to Christ, what made you believe. And that was your, 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 your need for him and your love for people that you wanted to bring a living Jesus to a dying world. <sighs> it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing to think. You know, like Paul says, listen, you can prophesy and you can preach and teach and you can know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. But if you don't have love, if you don't have love, you want nothing, nothing but a clanging symbol. To me, I don't know, that makes me shake in my boots. Because here's the deal. The kingdom of God is not about building. The kingdom of God is about people. And even though you might not be a pastor and you might not be a preacher who preaches on the pulpit, but what you are is a minister of Jesus Christ. You and I, we are ambassadors of Christ. God has assigned to each of us People that are under us, they're assigned to our voice. And I will tell you that in ministry, and you are all in ministry, different facets. Stop thinking that this right here is the be and end all of everything. Every one of us, God expects us to share our faith. God expects us. Because you know what? You can have a worldwide television ministry but if people don't turn that ministry on they've never heard the gospel so God has put you in that office place he's put you next to sinners why not to bash them over the head with the Bible not to tell listen you don't need to tell a sinner that they're in sin they already know it they'll tell you you know what I'm messed up I am messed up they just don't know how to get out. They just don't know that there is a way out, that there is a way of escape. They don't know it. But let me tell you something, beloved. If we fail at people, we fail. We fail. So when we talk and we tear down, and listen, I am not saying that we condone crazy doctrine. I'm not saying that we wink at sin and that grace is not grease. No, there's a day that we will answer. That we'll answer for everything. Every idle word that comes out of our mouth. Every, you know, every sin that we do not repent of will be judged on. I mean, yeah. That fire, hell, and brips. I mean, it, it's, it's not like it's not true. There's a heaven, there's a hell. There's eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. But I don't save people. You don't save people. I don't heal people. You don't heal people. It's the Spirit of God through us. And how ridiculous are we to the world? And how hypocritical. I mean, just think about it. If you're sitting there and you're tearing down somebody's ministry, 
you know, in Christianity, we, you know, we, we all know the lingo. We know all of this. But you, you think about it. When, when somebody who's not saved, there's somebody watching you. And when they hear you talking bad about Christian people, you know what the first thing they say is? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were a Christian. Listen, we all have our bad days. That's why we, we preach Christ. We preach grace. All have sinned. All have fallen short. I need Christ every day of my life. I need Christ to get up and to know where I'm going, know what I'm doing. I can't do anything within myself. I can't preach his gospel without his help. But if I'm so busy tearing down, we lose our credibility when we tear down other ministries, when we tear down even our brothers and sisters, we lose our credibility. Nobody wants to listen to us. But when we can stay calm, when we, when we have the fruit of the Spirit working in our life, gentleness, love, patience, people look at that and they see that there's something different. They see that there is something different. People are in error, and the Bible does tell us that, listen, when you see your brother stumble, you got to do what you can to restore him. You got to go. You can't, you can't condone sin. But there is a way to say things. And when you go to your brother, you go to them in love. You go to them in love, and you sit down, and you have a conversation this whole thing with Facebook and texting, I mean, it, it's like people just don't know how to talk to one another. People get news, oh, so-and-so died. The funeral is here. Can you imagine hearing about a loved one on Facebook? Pick up the phone. Talk to someone. Because people, we've lost that human touch. People need somebody to touch them. I will never forget, it was in the first couple of years that I was here ministering. And, and, and it, this precious lady was here and she was talking to me and she was just so shy and she had just, she'd just been, been through so much in her life. And, and all I did was I just reached out and I touched her arm and she jumped. And I said, what's the matter? Did I hurt you? I didn't mean, she said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just been so long that somebody's touched me. It's been so long since, since I felt a human being touch me and show me that kind of love. And she was a Christian for years. There's something really wrong with that. There's something really wrong with that. And people, we've just got to be better. We've got to do better. And if it's not inside of you, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, help me to do better. And listen, I'm the first one to say it. I don't, I don't have the anointing to love and be as patient with people as Samantha does. But I'm trying. I'm a whole lot better now, 10 years after being in this place and watching an example of it than I was. Do I still have ways to go? Absolutely. And listen, not every personality is for every personality. Everybody's got, got their ways of doing things. They've got their gifts for doing things. You gotta learn people's love languages. And just because you don't express love in a certain way and somebody expresses love in a different way, listen, you gotta understand, if I express love that way, it's not the way you express love, but I'm telling you that I love you. It was like an evangelist who had gone over, um, you know, to a different country. And she went and she prayed for this family. And this woman came out. And, you know, the evangelist was from America. And this woman came out and she started to chase this chicken around the yard. But she was so blessed by the, by the, the, by the evangelist. And the woman took the chicken and she cut the head off. And she handed the woman the chicken. 
And the woman sat there and she's from America and she's like, what, 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 what am I gonna do with this? She was horrified. And somebody had to say, do not reject that. Because in their country, they have given you the highest honor. And sometimes what happens in Christianity, we're so about, this is the right way to do it. The Bible says this. You don't deviate from this. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. And any time that you're going to go to somebody and try to correct something that they've said, and you go in an accusatory manner, you're getting shut down. You are getting shut down. I don't want to hear your mouth. Listen, when I first started, you know, I've been thinking a lot about over the 10 years. There was somebody who used to come here and after every sermon, after every sermon, this man would come up to me and it would be like, bam, he'd want to attack me. He'd want to challenge everything I said. And, you know, I was insecure back then. But finally, I had to grow up and I had to say to him, you know what? Until you can learn to come to me and have a conversation with me, don't talk. Because all you're doing is causing me to be resentful of you. And after a while, they softened. And when they softened and they didn't understand something I said or they had a different point or they wanted to add something to the sermon, they would come and they would say, you know what? I know you said this, and I was thinking this, and I was reading this, and I, and I said, okay. I don't have a problem with that because you're not putting me on the defensive. Being hurtful is never helpful. It is never, ever, 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 ever helpful. Being abrasive is never a good thing. And listen, even to our government, and we watch the news, and there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, you know, we're all shaking our heads about. And things that we are upset about. And there is a way to stand up for righteousness and say, I'm a Christian and I stand for this. But still, be respectful to the office and the position. Why? Because we are Christians. Why? Because we are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of the earth. That when we don't like what our officials are doing, stop calling them names. We're acting like the world does. We're no better than the world. In fact, we're worse because we've got the word of God. We've got, when, when, you, when you saw Jesus around authority, what, what, what did Jesus say? He said, when Rome, do, as, do as the Romans do. Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Listen, we know as children of God, we're not about this kingdom. We live according to the kingdom of God. And I also know, because if I read the Bible, I can see that things are playing out just as the Bible said. Everything that God has said, it is unfolding piece by piece by piece. So we need to stay calm and stay with God and get in our word. And instead of screaming and yelling like the world does and behaving like the world does, be that Christian who stands up and just says, listen, I don't agree with this. And if you don't like who's in office, well, then maybe you learn something. Next time, instead of just talking about it, get out there and use your voice and vote and vote. If you don't vote, you have no right to criticize or complain. I know that this is tough and this is so ABC of Christianity, 
But I think that we've, we've really strayed from the basics. And we're wondering why do we have to have a meeting that we are calling the body of Christ together to pray. And why it is so difficult, and this is the sad thing, why is it so difficult that you have to beg churches to be a part of it? Because we've walked away from our first love. I got news for you. The devil can quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Satan knows the scriptures probably better than most of the church of God knows the scriptures. That's why he can attack. That's why he can infiltrate our minds. Why? Because we don't have the faith that we should. We don't know the word like we should. We don't live the word like we should. I mean, isn't it a scary thing when you think about the church of Ephesus that they did they did so many things right. Jesus says, bravo. Bravo. But the problem is you left your, your first love. And if you don't repent and you don't change, you know what? You see something that you don't like. You hear something about somebody. You know what? It is not, un we, you know, sometimes to Christians, we use that, well, I don't want to start trouble. You will not start trouble when somebody says, you don't want to hear what so-and-so said. If it's not good, if it's not pure, if it's not lovely, if there's not any virtue in it, if there's no praise in it, no, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Switch the subject. Talk about the weather. Talk about the Yankees. Talk about a football game. Talk about anything else. But you can stop it. You can stop it. Stop trying to be politically correct and stop trying to be polite. Because if you don't stop it, it's just going to go and going to go and going to go. And you know what? And that's a gentle way of correcting somebody. You want to hear what they said? Not really. What do you mean? I, I don't want to hear. I wasn't there. I'm not a part of the problem. And I'm not a part of the solution. Don't bring me into it. Janine says, not my circus, not my monkey. It's true. If you're not a part of the problem, you're not a part of the solution, stay out of it. Just stay out of it. There was a... Um, you know, there was a certain thing of a spirit that the Pharisees had in, in their sense that I have to be right. In order for them to feel good, they had to make somebody else feel bad. It's sad. In order for me, I mean, they're insecure. See, the Pharisees, they knew about God, but they didn't know God. See, if you really know God, and you really know what God has done in your life, you'll never be envious. Because I look at somebody say like, say like Whitney Houston, in my opinion, I think that she was the greatest voice of our generation. I saw her in concert, and I got to tell you, it was clean, it was wholesome, and that woman, she could just stand there, and she could just sing, and she was just so gifted. It was, it was a God-given gift, and you know what? I'm a singer. I would love to sing like that, but I'm okay with what God gave me. Why? Because it came from him. And because I know him and I know who I am, I don't have to get envious and jealous of that. Because I know I'm the king's daughter. I know God has given me something that he's not given anybody else. God's given you something that he hasn't given anybody else. Bible says we are one body with many members. We are all gifted 
We are all anointed. And, and, the, and I love the way God does it. You know, many times I can go out and, and I can prophesy over people and I could, I could see so many things clearly in other people's lives. And yet when it comes to my own life, I can't see it. Why? God does it on purpose like that because we need each other. Because if I could do it all by myself, I would stay in isolation and I wouldn't need anybody. There would be no need for me to love people. Amen? You guys are really, really, really quiet. You know, God's desire is truly um, that all people would be saved. All people would be saved. You know, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoice over just one sinner. What does heaven do when somebody rejects? Personally, I think it breaks God's heart. Because I know, I know from my own children, man, sometimes they do things that I just want to wring their necks. And I got good kids. I got good kids. But I would never turn my back on them. I would never disown them. I could get angry about something, and then in five minutes, my anger is done, and I go, okay, what are we going to do about this situation here? I don't believe that God wants anybody else. I had somebody in my life, and they, they had a pharisaical spirit. And, and they would actually sound happy, you know, when people, like, sinners would get theirs. One time I looked at them, I said, what happens when you get yours? What happens if God ever did to your family what you're so happy that he did in somebody else's family? I don't think we should rejoice that people are lost. I don't think that we should beat them over the head and drag them into the kingdom either. Because you know what? Jesus is just the most awesome thing. He is just the most awesome, wonderful person and the greatest thing that ever happened to my life. He is. Why wouldn't I want everybody to feel that? I mean, when I think about what God has done in my life, I mean, yes, I've had tragedy. I've been to hell and back. But through it all, I have served a God who has been with me through fire and through flood. I have a God who has never given up on me. Don't you want that? He's never given up on you. That's why you're here today. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. And we've just got to understand that as, 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 as the body of Christ, listen, I got three kids. And, you know, they're, they're home and everybody's good. You know, when Kimberly comes home from college, they're all good for about three hours. And then, you know, all of a sudden, they're arguing or they don't agree. But at the end of the day, we're still the same family. We're still on the same team. You know, we'll kill each other, but we'll, qu we'll kill for each other. And don't ever try to step in. And don't you think that that's the way we should be with the body of Christ? Don't you think that we should, that we should defend each other? Don't you think that if, if your brother is doing wrong or, or, is, in, or, or is in sin or, or going go in a different direction, don't you think that we should wash the laundry in the house rather than airing it out there? I mean, how would you like to make a mistake? Something you said or something you wore. Somebody didn't like it. And then people posting things and talking about things and exposing your bad day. How would you feel? How would you feel? 
You know, the other day, son, we went, we went to this to this meeting on Saturday. And it's just funny because, you know, we're, we're, we're a body and we need to help one another. And when, and when something is not working or you can see, like, this is why I love Samantha. Like, she can see gifts on people. And many times if she sees somebody ministering, she, she has a way about her that says, you know what? I just, you know, I, I, she said, I could see this plan. And if you could just maybe tailor it this way or tailor it that way, I think it would bring, and there's such a life that if she's bringing correction, it doesn't feel like correction. So the other day I'm at this church and we went to, we went to a restaurant afterwards, went to Houlihan's and I'd gone to the restroom and my dress got caught in the back of my pantyhose. And thank God that before I walked out, I realized it. But what killed me was there were three ladies behind me that got a free show and never said anything. <laughs> you know, learn, learn how to help one another. Learn how to help one another. We don't want, we don't want anybody walking out and being embarrassed. You know, it, it's not about, listen, just let everything go. And, and, and you know, and everything is good in God. And, and, and I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about is let's do what God said. Let's speak life. Let's speak lovingly. If there's something that we don't understand, if there's something that we don't agree with, we don't need to blast it to everybody all over the place and expose the person because half the time when you're seeing these videos, they're cut and spliced. You're not hearing the beginning. You're not hearing the end of it. You're hearing a little clip and you've judged a person's ministry on a clip that you don't even have full understanding of what it is. And listen, and I'll tell you, and I'm a preacher. You feel like somebody's threatening you to give? Well, then know God yourself. If you don't feel God's telling you to give, then guess what? You don't have to give. That's, that's your choice. The way it works with me God always confirms whatever he's told me. And I can tell you 10 out of 10 times, if I'm in a church while the person's preaching, while something's going on, God has already given me a number to give. And 10 out of 10, that person will turn around and give, say, listen, I want an offering of this amount, and it'll be that. And if they don't, and I don't feel it, guess what? I don't do it. I don't agree with every preacher and everything that I hear. And yes, there are some things on Christian television that make me crazy and make me cringe. I, I don't like it when people charge people, give me $25 and I'll give you a prophetic word. I don't see it in here, so I can't support it. But I'm not going to take the time out of my life, because I am a busy person, to edit, cut, splice, and feed it. Because here's the thing. When you're reposting things, and you put ignorance up there, I guarantee you somebody is not as informed as you are. And they don't really understand what's going on. And they listen to it. And they take it as truth. Be very careful. If something's wrong, don't share it. Private message the person. Have a conversation with them. Or just leave it alone. And whatever you do, don't ever get in the ring with crazy people. Don't get in the ring with ignorance because you will never win 
you will engage it and it will start a war and if you just disarm it by walking away from it it'll go away whatever you know you don't don't nurture what you should neuter don't do that kind of stuff but blessed be the poor in spirit for they shall inherit the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven is theirs Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. As far as I'm concerned, if we spent all our time doing the things that Jesus said to do, we wouldn't have to worry about what he said not to do. Because there are so many other do's in the word of God than there are don'ts. And you can't change everybody. You can't tell everybody everything. But you're responsible for yourself. Don't let it come into your spirit. Don't let it come into your environment. That's your choice. What you, what is said to you, you cannot help. But how you react how you receive a thing, if you repeat a thing, all of those things are in your control. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I know that it's really, um, we're going to get ready to take the offering um, tonight. This is between um, Samantha's Little Bit of Heaven and Karen Orlando Ministries. I know this is a little bit Christianity 101, but I really think, um, I think it's time that we need it that we need to be more aware of it, that we just need to be, we need to be better. And sometimes, you know what? You don't need to be right. You don't need to be right. If you know the truth and the truth is in you, the truth will always find its way out. I promise you that. The truth always, 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 always outlives the lie. It always outlives the lie. It's why you don't always have, if you're a meek person, you don't always have to set the record straight. You don't have to. Because eventually, it'll all come out. People talk about you. Don't worry about it. If it's a lie, God will turn it around. God will expose it. God will bring the truth around. And, you know, like Paul, you think about it. Paul did everything that people said. He killed Christians. He was this, he was that. When he went to go preach, I mean, how do you live down what you actually did? You know what he did? He kept going. Because he had to believe the word. Because of Christ, everything has been made new. I don't have to explain. I don't have to justify. I'm not that person anymore. Just keep walking. Just keep doing. But do what Jesus said. I think if we just focus on the words in red, don't you think we'd be a lot happier? Don't you think that we would see more supernatural miracles and things happening? Because it's this strife that's in the body of Christ that I believe with all my heart is holding us back from the great things that God has for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you tonight. I thank you for every prayer request, Lord God. Lord, we know and we believe in Jesus' name for every salvation, every healing, every deliverance, Lord God, that it's turning into a praise report, Father God. So we give you the praise. We give you thanksgiving, Lord God, in advance, Lord God, for the answers to these prayers. And Lord, for the praise reports, God, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being faithful, Father God. And Lord, I thank you for this offering tonight, Lord. I know that so many people gave out of their sacrifice so, Father, I ask, God, that you would rebuke the devourer for their sake, Father. God, that you would give it back to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And, Father, those who could not give, Lord, because they just simply could not afford. Father, their prayers, Lord God, were seeds that were sown tonight, Father God. Their desire to be a blessing to someone is a seed, Lord God, that they planted tonight. Father, I pray for them, God, that you would bless the work of their hands. God, that you would open up doors that no man can shut, Father God. Bring them divine opportunity, Lord. 
make a way where there is no way. And Father, while they are in this this uh, wilderness right now of lack, Father God, assure them by your spirit that this is not a sentence, but a season, Lord God. Lord, that you will turn things around, Father. But in the process and while they're waiting, Lord God, allow them, Father God, to enjoy supernatural provision, Lord, to see you in a new way, Lord God. Provide great and mighty things for their life, Father. For those who have jobs, Lord God, we thank you for those jobs. I thank you. Uh, that you are the source of all our resources. We plead the blood of Jesus around every job in this place, Lord God. And Father, we ask you, God, to give them favor, Lord God. Give them promotion, Lord. Give them raises, Father God. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.